praise His wonderful name. Thank you for tuning in again. Thank you for taking your precious time out, just wanting to learn from His Word today. My text for this morning is taken from the book of Nahum, the book of Nahum, chapter 1 and verse 7. Chapter 1, verse 7. It says here, The Lord is good. The Lord is good. A strong hope in the day of trouble. And He knows those who trust in Him. Shall we pray? Amen. Amen. Father, this morning, I thank you for the person of the Holy Spirit. I want to pray that your anointing will rest upon me, upon the hearers, upon the readers. We give you all the glory in advance. We pray in Jesus' wonderful and glorious name. Everybody say, Amen and Amen. Now, this small, tiny book called the book of Nahum. It has three short chapters. Do you know what this book is all about? Anybody knows? Do you know what is the theme of this book? What is it try to emphasize right here in all these three chapters. If you don't know, let me tell you what this book is all about. It is all about the city of Nineveh and its judgment. You can see the name Nineveh appear three times in these three chapters. And every chapter, chapter 1, chapter 2, Chapter 3, every single chapter of this book all bears the name called Nineveh. For example, you can see that in chapter 1 verse 1, the word Nineveh appeared right there. In chapter 2 verse 8, again, the city of Nineveh is mentioned there. And again in chapter 3 verse 7, the word Nineveh appeared again. So this book, the whole book of Nahum, is all about Nineveh. Nothing else but Nineveh and the judgment of God. I hope all of you can get it. It is that simple. It is about Nineveh and all about its judgment. How God is going to judge this particular city. Now, before we approach this book and study it in detail, allow me to give you its brief introduction first. First of all, let us see that there are two places. There are two places. Where are those two places? The first place is called Nineveh and it's found in chapter 1, verse 1. The other place the other name of that place, beside Nineveh, is actually Judah. Judah's name appeared in chapter 1, verse 15. So that's all about the two places, the first point concerning the introduction. Now come to the second and the last point before we go to the lesson proper. The second point is, beside the two places, it is the two prophets. Who were the two prophets that were sent to this city called Nineveh? Of course, the first one uh, is called Nahum, found in chapter 1 verse 1. He was sent to Nineveh. Who else was the other prophet that was sent, that was sent to this city called Nineveh? Can you remember any? Any one of you knows? 
who was the other prophet that was sent to this same place called Nineveh. It is none other than the prophet Jonah. The prophet Jonah. Yes, you got it right. Jonah, you remember, God did send this man to this city called Nineveh. But when God called him to go, what was the answer he gave to God? He said no. And he went to the opposite direction. And as a result, God has to discipline these men. And God prepared a great fish just to swallow him up for three days and three nights. And God caused this prophet, God caused this man to fast for three solid days without food and without water right inside the great fish. So you can say he was kind of a lockdown under the MCO right inside the fish belly and nowhere to go. And in those three days, God gave him a free ride, a free ride using this great fish like a submarine, like a submarine. God transported him from Tashi, which is our present day called Southern Spain, from Tashi, God transported him all the way back to Nineveh. And Nineveh means our present day Iraq. So God transported this man, gave him a free ride in the fish, like a submarine. God transported him all the way from Tashi right down to Nineveh. And thank God, God reused this man again in this wicked city called Nineveh. So he only preached eight simple words and the whole city, 120,000 people all turned to God in that one day. Do you remember that? Wow, that was a great, great revival that ever, ever took place in the human history of man. Even on the day of Pentecost, only 3,000 got saved under the preaching of the Apostle Peter. But here, imagine, 120,000 souls got saved in the preaching with just eight words and all happened just in one day. Wow! There was a great, great things that God has done. Now, hundred years have passed. Things went back to the normal. The Ninevites forget about all the things that has happened hundred years ago. Now they are back to square. They are back to their sin again. They are back to their violence again. Now God had to send the second prophet. And that second prophet was the prophet called Nahum. And God sent him to that place called Nineveh. Now you may want to ask me the question, why God had to send one more prophet to this same place again? Why? Why God has to take two books in the minor prophet just to prophesy to the same city? What is the answer? Why God have to take this trouble? The answer is very simple. Because God's heart is for the city. God's heart is for the city. His heart is for the souls of men. Remember that. His heart is for the souls of men. He desires wicked people, wicked men to hear his message so that they can turn from their sin so that they can come back to God. Amen and amen. Now, so much about the introduction. Now, now, let me get into this tiny book called the book of Nahum that has only three chapters. And since it has only three chapters and is concerning the judgment on Nineveh, I've divided it under three main headings or three main outlines. Number one, 
is judgment declared. Judgment declared. That is chapter one. Number two, judgment describe. Judgment describe. That is chapter two. Number three, judgment deserve. Judgment deserve. That is chapter three. Notice first of all, point number one, judgment declare. Judgment declare. Chapter one. Now, how did God declare this judgment on Nineveh? Now, I'm going to read to you from the book of Zephaniah, chapter 2 and verse 13. I'm going to read to you Zephaniah, chapter 2, verse 13. Zephaniah the prophet was the contemporary to Nahum. That means he lived almost the same time as Nahum. And he prophesied this same word at a different place concerning Nineveh. Jephaniah chapter 2 verse 13. And this is what it says here. And he will stretch out his hand against the north. Talking about God stretching out his hand against the north. And what did God say? Destroy Assyria. Destroy Assyria. And make Nineveh a desolation as dry as the wilderness. Can you see? God declaring what is going to happen to Nineveh. So first of all, let us see. Let us see God's anger being portrayed right here in the first 14 verses of chapter 1. Now, in chapter 1 verse 2, it tells us very clearly that God was angry. Look at verse 2. Say, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges, what is the word? And is furious. So here you can see the anger of God being portrayed right here. God was very, very angry. You may say, who was God angry with? The answer is God was angry with his foe. That's point number one. God's foes. F-O-E-S. God was angry with his enemy. Look at chapter 1 verse 2 again. God is jealous. The Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. And he reserves wrath. For who? For his enemies. You may ask me, who was God's enemy? The answer is the Ninevites. Now, why were the Ninevites became God's enemy? Listen carefully. Whoever that is angry with the Jews, be it a nation or an individual, will become an enemy of God. What did I say? Whoever that is angry with the Jews, be it a nation or an individual, will automatically become God's enemy. Now, throughout history, the Ninevites always tortured the people of God. They always mistreated them. That is why they became the enemy of God as a result. Therefore, God assigned for them only his wrath, his anger, his indignation. This is why in chapter 1 verse 2, the last sentence it says, He reserves what? Wrath. He reserves wrath. For who? For his enemies. So that is God's foe, point one. Now we look at God's fury. God's fury, F-U-R-Y. Now you see how God display his anger right here in chapter 1 of Nahum. Chapter 1, verse 3, talks about his anger being displayed right in the storm, right in the whirlwind, right in the clouds and on the earth. In chapter 1 verse 4, 
His anger can be seen right in the sea, in the river, and also in the forest. In chapter 1 verse 6, I want you to read what he says here. This is how Nahum began to describe concerning the fury of God. What he says here in chapter 1 verse 6. He says, who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like what? Like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. I'm sure you have seen, you have seen people getting angry before. Have you? I'm sure you do. In all your years of growing up, you have seen people getting angry. They can be the teacher. They can be your father or mother. They can be your brother, your sister, or even your boss. When you see people getting angry, it must have been a very terrible sight to look at. Is it not true? One more to say when God is angry. Think of it. One more to say when God is angry. Look at all the things that he displayed in terms of using the nature. The nature, be the cloud, be the earth, be the sea, be the river. He displayed all his anger right there for us to see. Now look at chapter 1 verse 8. It says what? Concerning Nineveh. How God is going to use the overflowing flood to make an utter end of that place. Can you see that? He wants to make an utter end of that place using flood water. In chapter 1 verse 10, he says, They, referring to the Ninevites, they shall be devoured like stubble, fully dried. Have you ever happened to burn grass before? When they are wet, it is not easy to burn. But when it becomes dry, like stubble, fully dry, like described here in chapter 1 verse 10, it will be easily burnt off. So that's the description. How fast Ninevites will be consumed and destroyed within minutes and within hours. So we have seen God's anger being portrayed. Now we want to look at God's assurance. God's assurance being prophesied right here. So we have looked. At chapter 1, verse 1 to 14, now we come to the assurance that have been said, that have been prophesied right here. And we are going to read only one verse before we go to chapter 2. So on one hand, that's from verses 1 to verses 14, you see the fury of God, the anger of God being displayed on the Ninevites. Now we're going to see only one verse. We're going to see the favor of God. The assurance of God, the comfort of God that God gives to his people, Judah. First of all, let us see his mercy. His mercy. It is found in chapter 1, verse 12 and verse 13. It says here, the last part of verse 12. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. Verse 13. For now... I will break off his yoke. That means referring to the Ninevites. I will break off his yoke from you. You'll no more be under bondage. You'll not be under the slavery of the Ninevites. I will break off your chain, your yoke, and I will burst your bonds apart. So God says, I'm going to set you free, Judah. You were once under their bondage under the clutch of their hand, being tortured, being killed by them. From now on, I'm going to show your mercy. I'm going to set you free. So that was the assurance God gave to the people of Judah. Now, number two, beside we see his mercy, now we are going to see his message. So what was 
the message right here. The message comes in two ways. The first one is bad news to the Ninevites. Bad news to the Ninevites. So chapter 1 verse 15, it says, For the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut down. So here God gave a bad news to the Ninevites, telling Ninevites, that's the end for you. You'll no more pass through the land of Israel again. That's the end. So that's the bad news for Ninevite. But on the other side of it, it is good news for the Jews. Number two, it is a good news for the Jews. In chapter 1, verse 15, the first part, what it says, Behold, on the mountain, the feet of him who bring good tidings, who proclaim peace, O Judah, keep your appointed feast, perform your vow. So on one hand, God spoke about the fall and the destruction of the Ninevites. On the other hand, he spoke about the good news concerning the Jews. Now look carefully right here. Talking about the good news, the one who brings the good tidings to the people of Judah. The Bible describes these messengers concerning their feet. Can you see that? He says, Behold, on the mountains, the feet, the feet of him who bring good tidings. Now, this same thought, talking about the feet who bring good tidings, is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7, and also in Romans chapter 10, verse 15. Isaiah 52, verse 7, Romans 10, verse 15. He said, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and who bring glad tidings of good things. So here, the emphasis is on the feet. Let me ask you the question. Are feet beautiful? Our feet is not so beautiful. Am I right? Do you agree with that? Do you take photos? Do you take photos or selfie on your feet and then send it to your friends? Do you? No, of course. All of us, we don't take pictures on our feet. We take pictures on our face. Am I right? Ask yourself today, when you meet people, when you meet people, what do you look at actually? We look at their face, am I right? Do you look at people's feet and see how beautiful they are? Do you look at their feet? Oh, your feet is very beautiful. Do you look at their feet? And say how beautiful they are? I'm sure not. Am I right? So, the emphasis described for us right here is a picture of a herald, the one who runs with the good news, the one who runs with the gospel of good news and bring it to others. God says their feet is beautiful. Their feet is beautiful. Amen. Amen. How many a times, how many times we put so much emphasis on our look? Is it not correct? Yes, we put so much emphasis on the look, but we forget about the feet. What is more important to God today is not your face. I know face is important, but to God, it's more important is the feet. Are you using your feet? To bring the good news of glad tidings to others. That is the most important thing of all. So very quickly, we have touched on point number one. The judgment declared, chapter one. Now we are going to move on to judgment described, chapter two. The judgment described, judgment described, chapter two. Here, Nahum described in details how Ninevite is going to fall. Here, he is just like a news reporter. Here, he can see it with his own eyes. Pictures, things, the scene that has happened. 
just unrolling right before his eyes, as if like he see it already happen, even though it hasn't happened yet. It is still in the future, but he can see it all in details. First of all, he saw the attackers. So Nahum begins. He began with the attackers, found in chapter two, verse one to verse twelve. So here, chapter 2, verse 1, what it says, He announced the attackers, chapter 2, verse 1, He who scatters, He who scatters has come up before your face. So here, Nahum is actually announcing the attackers that's going to come upon the Ninevites. So in chapter 2, verse 3, He described their weapons. He said their shield will be red in color. Number two, he described their warriors. Not only described their weapons, he described their warriors. Found in chapter 2 verse 3, he says their valent men will be in color, will be red in color. So here Nahum can even see the color of their uniform, that all of them will be clad, wore clothes, that is red in color, or uniform, that is red in color. Now, in those days, in the times of Nahum, it is something that is very alien, something that they have never heard of. But Nahum described that their weapons will be red, their shield will be red, their clothing, their uniform will also be red in color. So, Nahum went on to describe their wagons in chapter 2, verse 3 to 5. Is going to run like torches in the street and they are going to run like lightning. You can read that in chapter 2, verse 3 to verse 5. Then Nahum described concerning, concerning how this uh, city is going to be taken over by the, the Babylonians. In chapter 2, verse 7, Nahum described the gates of the river will be opened the palace will be dissolved. Now, we all know that Nineveh uh, was known of its wall and fortresses, and it is so high and it's so thick, so much so that even three chariots can run abreast on top of the wall. And that's how thick the wall was. And it's very, very difficult even to overcome that city called Nineveh. And on top of that, that city of Nineveh was surrounded by waters. So there's no way the Babylonians will have the opportunity even to defeat them. But God said they will be defeated. So tradition says it took almost three years, three attempts. They tried three times. The Babylonians tried three times to defeat the Ninevites. And they couldn't do it until the last try, until the third time, where, because of the rainfall, and during the raining season, and the rainwater hit on the wall, and hit on the gates, and then throw it open. And as a result of that, the Babylonian was able to go in, and then to destroy the city. So here, Nahum described concerning their weapons, the attackers is going to come, describe the we weapons, describe about their warriors, describe about their wagons, their chariots. Then also he talks about that it's going to be a day of looting, a day of looting. Chapter 2, verse 9, verse 10, their silver, their gold, all will be taken away. It will, be, it will be a day of looting. Now, whom continue? It will be a day of lameness. A day of lameness. Chapter 2, verse 10, say their heart will melt, their knees will shake, and pain on every side. And it say their faces will be drained of color. The day of lameness. And also, it will be a day of losses. L O 
S S E S. A day of losses in chapter two, verse eleven to verse twelve. You can read that for yourself. By the way, lions were actually the emblems, the symbol of the Assyrians. Yes, they always regarded themselves as lions. So here Nahum picture them and see them as lion, but not as strong as before. Now, Nahum saw all of them as weakling, being weak, and also dying. So here you can see they were powerless before their enemies. You can read all that in chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. So we have seen the attackers. Now we see the avenger. Only one verse. Chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. And this is what God said. Behold, chapter 2, verse 13. I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. Yes, God says, I'm against you. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions, your young men. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messenger shall be heard no more. So here you can see the first point, we talk about judgment declare, that's chapter 1. Then number 2, judgment describe, that is in chapter 2. Now number 3, I want to close with this last point, judgment deserve, judgment deserve, chapter 3. Now you may ask, why God sends such a judgment on the Ninevites? What's the reason? So here in chapter 3, Nahum gave us the reason as to why God, God poured out his judgment on this nation. The first reason God gave is because of what? Because of their murderous, murderous forms. Murderous form. They love to kill people. The Ninevites love to kill people. That's why chapter 3 verse 1 Nahum say, woe to the bloody city. To the bloody city. Why? Because they love to shed blood. So they love to fight. They love to kill. They love to shed blood. And that was the reason God has to pass judgment on this particular city called Nineveh. What else? Why did God send judgment? Because number two, because of moral failure. Moral failure, chapter 3, verse 4 to verse 6. It talks about the multitudes of what? Helotries. And also multitudes of seductive heloid. Prostitute everywhere in the city. That's why verse 5, he says, God say, Behold, I'm against you, say the Lord of hosts. God is against this particular city. Why? Because of the moral failure of this city. Because through this city, it influences all other cities on the face of the earth. And as a result, God passed, God passed judgment on this city called Nineveh. What else? Besides the murderous form, moral failure. Number three, because of misery. Misery. Finalized. Here, you're going to see how this city, number one, being destroyed. Chapter three, verse seven. It says here, it shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is ruined. Nineveh is laid waste. So it will be destroyed. Number two, it described that they will be defenseless. Defenseless. Chapter 3, verse 13. Surely your people in your midst are like women. Women means weakling. Instead of being men, you become like women. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. That means without defense. Now it's defenseless. And fire should devour, shall devour the bars of your gates. Then not only it will be destroyed, it will be defenseless. Then number three, it will be devoured. Chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. It says here, there the fire will consume you, the sword will cut you down, and they will devour you 
like the swarm of locusts. You see, when locusts invade on a piece of land, nothing will be left behind. That means everything will be stripped back. That's what it means. And not only you'll be destroyed, you'll be defenseless, you'll be devoured, they'll be dispersed. Now look at it. Chapter 3. Chapter 3. And verse 18, your people will be scattered on the mountains. Yes, will be scattered all over the mountains and no one to gather them. So that is the description given to the Ninevites that they will be dispersed. And lastly, they will all be dead. They will all be dead. It says your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. In other words, you'll be dead. You'll be gone. That's what it means. So in conclusion, as we end this book, what do we see here? Can you see the ungodly, those who are haters of the Jews, where they will end up? They will end up by getting themselves hurt and killed in the end. Let me say this in closing. Nobody can fight against God and win. Nobody can fight against God and win. Nobody can. This applies to nations of the world as well as to individuals. Remember that. Shall we pray? Amen and amen. Lord, we thank you that you are sovereign, that you are mighty. Thank you that you're watching over Israel today. And that you are watching over your church that is all over the world. May your sovereignty rule over this world and over all the kingdoms of men. We praise you. We love you. We give you all the glory. We pray in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Amen and amen. I hope I can hear from you all again next time on the next book, which is the book of Habakkuk. God bless you. Amen and amen.